So we just spent the last three days doing group presentations about the Mongols. And I was hoping you had the following things. Now, number one, I was looking for good visuals because some people cannot learn without the visual. Some people can. They can process. They're very auditory. And the words will do just fine. Other people need a picture to better understand. So I was looking for good visuals. I was also looking for an appropriate scale, which is a challenge because sometimes when you research, it's totally correct, but it's you know, collegiate level, very highbrow, you're not going to reach your audience if it shoots right over their head. Uh, some stuff, you're, you know, you're spoon feeding it, you're condescending, you're, it's too low. So ha finding that sweet spot was something I was looking for. Also, I was hoping that everybody contributed in some way. I put you in groups, different people. Some people were very good speakers, not so hot at researching or vice versa. Some people, history is very easy for them other people it's very difficult but I was looking that every person in the group utilized their talents and I think that's important and also I was looking for the presentation to be understood I walked in the shoes of a 15 16 year old and thought to myself would I understand this back in 1990 when I was your age not too academic where you miss people so that's what I was looking for and there were 10 items uh, these are going to be your essay question when the time comes for the exam. And I ask you to put this together. So for those who maybe missed the boat or for absent, these are the 10 things I need you to know about the Mongols. So the size of the Mongol conquest compared to other civilizations. Up to this point in history, there was nothing, nothing the size of the Mongols. Absolutely massive. But it was kind of a flash in the pan. It only lasted 162 years. And I thought the best group was a group that took rulers on the geohistogram and with the ruler you went to the Mongols it was five inches on the geohistogram you compared it to Rome Rome was two and a half so it was double the size of Rome which is considered a huge civilization and uh, where did the Mongols come from where did they originate from the steppes of Mongolia a place that you would not think warriors would come from very rough terrain rough environment tough way to make a living so I was looking for that for number one and you can't talk about the Mongols without talking about Genghis Khan. It would be like telling the American history story without George Washington. You could not do this. Now, Genghis Khan unified his people. Now, his name was Temujin. He had a real name. It's almost like uh, Siddhartha got the title of the Buddha. Genghis Khan is a title for Temujin. And Temujin t uh, took his people, unified them, and he was the impetus, he was the catalyst of making the Mongols spread out. And Genghis Khan was a remarkable leader in that respect. And three and two are very similar. Uh, how did he change his people from pastoral nomads into this war machine? And pastoral nomads are people that live by uh, herding animals, with animals. And from the steppes of Mongolia, how did this switch occur? Well, first of all, he had to get their loyalty. He had them see themselves as part of a unified Mongol versus tribal or versus division. He got the people on board with a common identity, and that is huge for any organization, for any leader. And then he re made them realize speed. They had speed on their side. They had speed in a way that nobody could defense it. And it's one of those things you have a little taste of victory and a little more. Your confidence grows a little more and a little more. And he gave them the tools, and primarily it was their horsemanship and their speed and just fear. Uh, some of the sharper people in class saw a parallel between the Mongols and the Vikings. Yeah, I mean, the Vikings, fear, speed. For 300 years, the Vikings did their thing. For 162 years, the Mongols did their things. Now, weapons and tactics, I already mentioned it a moment ago, the horse. The greatest horsemen the world ever seen. Speed. They could shoot arrows off their horse in any direction, right, left, forward, backwards. Uh, they could move, cover ground faster than anybody ever could at this point. Their swords, their scimitars, their curved swords were effective. They had methods for siege warfare. They had the tools to do the job well, and that's what made them successful. And the horse, and in class I said, think of all of your material items. Think of your phone, your car, all the material, your clothes, all your material items, put it together. That's less important to you than the horse was to the Mongol. It was paramount. It, their culture was based around it. And they used the horse in, you know, they had different types of horses. Like you might have different vehicles in your garage. You know, if you have a Fusion, you have an Escape, and you have an F-350, three different vehicles, 
for, you know, you use them for different times. And the horse was the be all end all to the Mongols. And number six, Kublai Khan was Genghis Khan's grandson. And Kublai Khan was a little more cerebral, a little more academic, interested in learning. And uh, him and Marco Polo spending almost two decades together. So Genghis Khan really had three generations that were able to keep the Mongols successful before things broke down. So Kublai Khan, he's synonymous with something called the Yuan Dynasty, which is when the Mongols conquered China and ruled China for a short amount of time. And Kublai Khan... Um, is synonymous with that. Now, if you think of the Mongols like a wave that went through Asia, waves recede back, what was left behind? To the western portion, it was Islam. The eastern portion, it was Buddhism. To this day, in modern times, it is still there. So, as the Mongols spread, they had Islamic and Buddhist um, leaders emerge and to, to run the show. And again, you see this with religion. If the leadership is following a particular religion, it tends to spread to the people. And this is another example in history of this being true. Uh, Marco Polo. Now, Marco Polo was not Mongol. He was Italian. And Marco Polo, uh, he hung out with the Mongols for two decades. And when he returned back, and, I mean, talk about some adventures and, and just his travels. And he was thrown in jail for a year. And to entertain the other prisoners, he told the prisoners of his incredible travels and what he learned at the, the feet of Kublai Khan. And um, these, this book went on to be, well, probably a lot of people couldn't read, but to be read too. It learned about, it was just riveting to the people, and it really reinvigorated the Silk Road, this Asia the, to the West sort of uh, connection that used to be. And his book invigorated that. I think a simple example to show, like another example of cultural diffusion, you take pasta. When he was in China and in Mongolia, he was eating rice noodles. Goes back to Italy, uh, uses that uh, noodle making process with the semolina wheat, which is in Italy. And I think we all can agree that's a positive thing. So Marco Polo and Kublai Khan, their stories are um, interconnected. And one of the great travelers uh, of the world and a very, very interesting guy. Uh, number nine, the correlation between the Mongols and the bubonic plague. Now, we already learned about the plague in six years from 1347, 1353, taking out a third of Europe roughly. Well, where did that come from? Now, the bubonic plague hit China in, you know, the... 1310s or in that area. So the Mongols are moving across Asia and they have these big, you know, uh, food, you know, carts going across. Well, these mice are attracted to that smell. A few of those polluted mice get aboard the food, make their way. So the Mongols brought the plague from the east to Europe and a little precursor to the devastation that we already learned about. And then number 10, the Mongols did not last very long. They were good conquerors. They weren't the most fantastic leaders. If I use a parallel of uh, Alexander the Great or the Romans, when they conquered, they established good governance in its place. The Mongols really weren't wired that way. And they declined because they broke into four. A real simple rule of anything, yet alone history, there is strength when you're united. There's weakness when you're divided. And they divided into four. There wasn't one strong leader to unify the people, and they faded out and, and moved back. So it's kind of a remarkable story. The Mongols were game changers of history, but they weren't lasting very long. Um, they conquered uh, you know, a amount of land that is remarkable to think about, but it didn't last forever. So that is the story of the Mongols. And if you can uh, write a reasonable facsimile of what I said when it's test time, you'll do really well. Um, I enjoyed listening to your presentations. I appreciated the efforts. I think we improved from the last time. The second time we did this, I heard better projection, uh, better use of hand gestures, gesticulation, better articulation, and uh, more confidence. And that's what I like to see. I like to see that growth as the year goes by. So, bye-bye, Mongols. Africa ahead. And thank you for watching.